Hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here. I'm still a little jet lagged, so I apologize, uh, but, but it's nice to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about Calm Technology, which is uh, actually not anything new at all. It's at least 20 years old, these concepts, but I think it's really important to bring them back now that we're in the era that was original, originally described by these people um, 20 years ago. So uh, this is the quote that we see constantly. Uh, where it's, it's this kind of utopian quote where there's going to be 50 billion devices online by 2020 and every research analyst is really excited about this perfect utopian future in which everything is connected and can talk to each other. When you get to the airport, you automatically get checked into your flight. When you get to the hotel, everybody knows you're at the hotel. Everything can talk to each other. Everything's smart and everything has chips in it. And uh, I tried to look at this future and see like looking at our current world, we have information overload already. We have interfaces that don't necessarily work. We have lots of remote controls. We don't necessarily have this utopian um, future right now. We have kind of a mild dystopia where it's just dystopian enough that we're not uh, rioting. We, we kind of are dealing with this annoying interface. First off, you know, we have this great future in which we can get everything very quickly yet then there are some lags, right? We can call somebody on Skype halfway across the world, but then there's an issue and then we get annoyed with it. So it's this kind of mild dystopia. Uh, so I tried to consider some future dystopian scenarios, like the smartwatch is kind of interesting, right? On the one hand, you don't have to look at your phone all the time and get really distracted when you get a text message. You can get the text message on your phone. Um, but I've been having fun with everybody at my office that has smartwatches and meetings by texting them during meetings and then watching them just like, you know, Pavlovian like stare and drool. <laughs> and and, and it's, been, it's been interesting because on the one hand, it is nice because you have the information right there. But on the other hand, you have to set all of these apps up to not send too many messages. And you have battery life issues. The smartwatches are usually designed to be very colorful, when in reality you don't need color, you just need the minimum amount of text with a one-year battery life display. I used to wear all sorts of quantified self-technology until it ran out of batteries, so I think that the future is here, but it's really low on battery life. So then I thought about the smart fridge. There's, there's all these agencies and all these managers and lots of executives and lots of future forecasters that talk about the smart fridge. What does the smart fridge do? Does it tell you that some food is, is going bad? You can tell that by looking at it. You open the fridge and it smells bad. Oh, something's wrong, right? I don't need an app to send me a text message to my smartwatch to tell me that the banana is bad. The banana has evolved a way to tell you that it's bad by turning brown. <laughs> it's really smart technology, you know? <laughs> Uh, so when you put this all together, you get this kind of dystopian kitchen of the future where every single appliance is written by different developers in a different language using a different protocol. They don't talk to each other because they're all behind walled gardens and you have the future Tower of Babel where everything falls down. Now, this is fine if you're a system administrator and you like to go home every day and system administrate your smart home, right? But not everybody wants to go home and be a system administrator on their hue light when it doesn't talk to the smart things, when it doesn't talk to the, 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 um, the Nest application. I just rented uh, my spare room to somebody and he started sending me emails. He says, how do I turn on the heat? And I say, well, you go to the Nest app. He's like, what? <laughs> like, I don't have a smartphone. Oh, okay. Um, well, then click here and here. So I was just writing him documentation for my own house and realizing that that's pretty ridiculous. Like, he can't even, you know, exist in this house. But the other issue is when you inherit this technology, when you buy a new house and you buy it 10 years later, then somebody's going to have to take you through all of the weird technology that they've installed in their house. You know, heaven forbid that they actually integrate it into the house or they, they take it away. So um, one of my friends moved out and he took all of the Hue light bulbs with him. So I was sitting there finding all these light bulbs and trying to put them back in and then realizing I didn't need the Hue light bulbs to begin with. But there, there are these issues that, that might come up just because everybody wants to put too much complexity into devices. Everything want, everybody wants everything to communicate with each other. And you end up with these situations where the technology is really visible and blatant instead of getting out of the way and letting you live your life. So we already exist in this kind of era of interruptive technology where we're kind of existing in this simultaneous time 
or we're existing in the time of Facebook and the text messages that interrupt us and tweets and everything else that we're subscribed to on our phone. And then the other technologies in our surrounding environment. And this creates kind of a, not a sense of calm, but more of a sense of panic, like an architecture of panic. And I think that we need to find the opposite. As we have more and more devices, we're going to have bandwidth issues, attention issues, design issues, uh, supply chain issues. And if we try to look at these early on, we're not going to run into these issues later. So this, this idea of calm technology uh, was come up with in the mid-90s and, and even earlier by these guys Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown from Xerox Park. And what they did was had a future laboratory of things. For instance, they had these smart active badges that they wore around their necks, and when they walked through to go to work in the morning at Park, the front door would know that they were there and would turn on their computer in the background because, of course, it took three or four minutes for a computer to boot up back then. Uh, there were what they called the future would be filled with ta uh, pads, tabs, and boards, which we now basically have pads, tabs, and boards. Uh, and um, you would be able to like see who was in the office at a specific time. They made all these interesting future technologies. And after they were living with more devices than humans um, in the early 90s, they decided to write some papers about the effects on attention and how we could better design these devices. And so they wrote this paper called The Coming Age of Calm Technology. This is on calmtechnology.com. I've basically taken all these papers and, and brought them back to life so that people can read them. And they talked about the, the difference in eras. First, we had the mainframe era, where it was many people to one computer. Then we had the desktop era, where there was one computer for every person, or maybe three people for a computer in, in a given household. And then we have mobile technology. And now, in the Internet of Things, there are many devices per person. Um, and so they go through this and the shifts on our culture and, and how we interact with, with this technology as we go through these different eras. So one of the, my favorite quotes from this paper is that technology shouldn't require all of our attention because then technology gets in the way. It should just require some of it and only when necessary. So the least amount of technology necessary to get the point across. And how to do this is looking at how you design an alert style, how you design how that technology gets your attention. Uh, and one of the ways to do this is to empower peripheral vision. As humans, we have a lot of high resolution vision right here in our area of focus. But as you go back further and further, you get low resolution attention in the periphery. But you can compress a lot of information into the periphery uh, by using different alert styles, like haptics and uh, audio alerts and buzzes and things like that. So you can basically be aware of way more things without having to shift your focus to that high resolution attention. And this kind of ambient notification style allows you to have many devices in your home without getting totally overwhelmed. So how do we do this? This is another quote from the paper. If a, if a technology is calm, it can move from the center of your attention and back again very easily without getting in the way or distracting you from your primary task. And so then you can have information that's informing without overburdening. So let's look at some examples. My favorite example is a tea kettle. You set the tea kettle, you forget it, and under its own power it will alert you when it's ready. That's it. You can be in another room, it's an unambiguous screech, right? You know exactly what it is, what it's doing, and that the tea is done. This is a really simple piece of technology. Um, so a little technology goes a long way. If you look at this other piece of technology, it's just a simple toilet occupied sign. A lot of calm technology is boring because you don't notice it anymore. It's part of your environment. Even in your peripheral vision, if you're not wearing glasses or if you have poor vision or you don't speak whatever language, you can see from this whether the toilet is occupied or not. It's green or red. Even if you're red, green, colorblind, you can still see that the toilet is not available or available, and you don't have to translate it into a bunch of languages. It's really simple. Uh, this is another <laughs> example that's under development right now. This is basically a light-based status system. A lot of people do this on development teams. They, they say, is the server up? OK, we have a green light. Is the server down? It's red. Is there some issue where the database is filling up? OK, well, it's yellow. Uh, so this is a really simple system. It's connected to this app called Beeminder. So Beeminder is a system for tracking your goals, and if you get off track, they take your money. So there's an incentive to do things like run every morning or don't smoke. But the issue is that um, this guy Aaron was tracking 
like 14 or 15 different things in the system. And he didn't want to wake up every morning and check to see if he was on track or not. So he just put them into one system and then got a light. So in the morning, he'd wake up and ambiently, if the light was yellow, he'd check it. Or if the light was red, he would check it because that meant he was getting off track on his goals and he should actually check the app. So this was basically saying, don't overburden yourself by checking all of these things, only check it if it's necessary. Under the same idea with different colored lights, this is a hue light um, in my house and it's connected to a weather report. So it shines the color of the weather that it's going to be that day. So in these magical advertisements that you see from large technology companies where there's like this perfect day, uh, I, I really don't like those. You know, you wake up and there's a computer voice that tells you it's going to be 72 degrees outside or like, you know, it's, it's amazing. And uh, it, it really, like, you never see another human until like the end of the day when the person goes on the date and it just seems really lonely and mostly you're just dealing with these beautiful screens, you know, the corning day of glass where everything is perfect. It's like, wow, that guy has $50,000 to spend on his smart home technology. Right? So what happens when you don't have that or you forgot to upgrade or like something gets destroyed? Like all you need is wake up in the morning and if the light is yellow, it's going to be sunny. And if the light is blue, it's going to rain. And if it's kind of gray, it's going to be cloudy. And then if you want to, you can look at the iPad on the wall and actually see the weather pr prediction. But you shouldn't unless you see the light and it's interesting to you. So this is an example of peripheral vision. You know what it's going to be based on the light color. You don't need to know anything else. So in terms of designing column technology, there are, there are some principles. Um, Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown said that a technology should inform while being calm, while in calming, making you feel calmer, and then make use of the periphery, which we, which we talked about. And then designing for people first is really important. People come up to me all the time and they say, I'm really bad at technology. And I say, no, technology is bad at you. <laughs> What usually happens is somebody says, usually an executive says, we want this app with all of these different features. And when they do that, the market doesn't understand the features. They can't really learn the system. It's not intuitive. And then they have to support all these different features. And so they can't focus on making an app that's really good. And so, and then the other thing that happens is people try to design these machines that act like people. Machines with a human voice. And it gets into this horrible uncanny valley thing. So the worse we design technology, the more we force people to act like machines, and the less we enable people to be more human. So machines shouldn't act like humans. Humans shouldn't act like machines. You really want to amplify the best of each. And an example of that is Google search. You type in your search, and it doesn't tell you exactly what you want. It gives you a list of things ranked on what other people have visited in the past and what other th people think are important. It has you make the executive decision as a human curator what's important to you, but it doesn't give you that whole thing. It says, you know, we did the hard work for you of sorting through these search results very quickly, but it's up to you to choose what's relevant to you. And so that's, that's a really good way of amplifying both human and machine. The machine does 80% of the annoying bot-like work, and then the, the humans do the other 20%. So you always have to have this human in the loop. And so you can always tell a product that's going to fail if it does one of these things. So on the other hand, you know, if you're trying to design something that speaks to people, you don't have to have technology really speak in a human voice or definitely in, you know, in some sort of spoken word voice because then you have translation problems. And if you design it really well, you, don't you can get around translation, which I really like since it's kind of an issue. Uh, so the Roomba vacuum cleaner, when it's done, just says da ding And when it gets stuck, it goes dun-dun. And it doesn't keep like eating the drapes or whatever, you know. You you people find the Roomba endearing because it doesn't keep going. When it gets stuck, it stops, it calls for help, and you as a human help the robot out. The robot isn't smarter than the human or try to be smarter than the human. It asks for help. And when a human helps a robot, then suddenly the robot is more human like. And this is why people name the Roombas and weirdly why cats ride on top of them. <laughs> This Lumo back smart posture sensor is really great because everybody tends to slouch, you know, it's awful. So what it does is it just buzzes you when you're slouching. So this uses haptic feedback to speak to you. It doesn't send you a message on your phone, it just says buzz. It's just a little tiny reminder of what you might need to do. And stand up straight now. Um, the sleep cycle app is really nice because you set it, you set an alarm for when you want to wake up 
and you like put it face down in your bed, and it uses the accelerometer to measure your movement. So the whole point of this app is that it monitors your REM cycles and wakes you up at the proper time so that you're not groggy in the morning, which is fantastic. It'll wake you up like right before you're supposed to, supposed to wake up. And the other thing that it does is makes what was formerly invisible visible. So if you get a lot of data, you can start to see over time and correlate things. Like it'll ask you, did you drink caffeine today? Did you drink alcohol? And then it'll correlate that with your sleep quality. And this is the only app where I've actually cared about sleeping because I usually try to get the least amount of sleep possible and get away with it. But it gives you this sleep score of like 99% if you get like 10 hours of sleep and it shows you your wave patterns. And so I try to get like the best wave patterns and 99% sleep and then I brag about it and like screenshot it and it's really stupid. But I've gotten so much more sleep because of this. So you can create this kind of ambient awareness through these different senses. So we, we covered like haptics versus auditory alerts, light status versus a full display. When you're hitting a you know, record button on a video camera, there's a little light status that says it's recording. It's a red button. People know it's recording. It's OK. Positive or negative tones versus actually speaking. And then transparency. So the, uh, Mark Weiser came up with this idea of you know, inner office windows were you know, a great way to tell whether somebody was in the office or not without removing their privacy. The Jawbone Up is kind of interesting. It, it had hardware issues, unfortunately, but this really doesn't have any user interface at all and makes use of the headphone jack on your phone to actually send data and, and sync, which is really clever. So you don't need to like plug it into your computer. Uh, and there's a little button on the end where you can press it and then it gives you information. It's, it's pretty interesting. Of course, the hardware was the issue in this, the limiting factor. Uh, this is an experiment uh, by Natalie Jermajenko and Mark Weiser at Park. They said, what if we could visualize the network traffic that was going on at Park Research? And so they made this dangling wire, and it would rotate and, and vibrate based on how much traffic was going through the, the, the network at Park Research at that time. So all you had to do is like walk down the hall, like you could actually hear it too. So like if you heard this whirring sound, you'd be like, wow, what's going on? And suddenly everybody would kind of crowd around it and say, oh, well, I did this cool thing. And everybody would visit each other's office. And what are you doing? Like now, if you're using BitTorrent, you probably, this thing would just vibrate the whole time. But, um, but usually it's like, you know, if you had this at your office, you'd be like, oh, I just uploaded like two terabytes of data or I just you know, contributed something on GitHub and you'd be able to, to see what was going on. And this was kind of just this fun ambient art experiment type thing. So let's talk a little bit about calm technology and privacy. Um, I talked a little bit about this at the design meetup, but the definition of privacy that we have is, is you know, multi, right? There's, n there's not really one set definition, but some people say it's the ability to have control over where your content goes and who it's accessed by. It's this kind of certainty. When I share this data, it's going to go here, and these are the people that are going to access it. I like this definition. It's reasonable. Um, or a feeling of perception of security. So the example is in Second Life, people were building these really beautiful banks with all these marble-like columns, and then they were having people deposit the real world money in these banks. And of course, the banks were fake, because in Second Life, you can make a virtual bank and design the feeling of trust. This is an example of a school bus system that had a lot of crime on the buses. So they put security cameras into the buses, but they only put security cameras in one in five buses. But they put this, this actual, uh, uh, <laughs> the actual uh, security camera case without the security camera in it. And just the idea that somebody was watching drove down the crime on the bus. My favorite definition of privacy is privacy is the ability not to be surprised. You just don't want to be surprised about what's going on with your data. Um, an example is this guy's Hotmail account started getting all of these people's uh, Gmail messages, and he got surprised, and so did everybody else. Or when suddenly the terms of service in a website change on you, and you don't know what's going on. The equivalent of like having somebody redesign a site without telling you, like let's say Evernote were to be completely radically designed and a lot of people use Evernote. Uh, that's the equivalent of somebody going into your house when you're not there, changing all the cupboards and changing the layout of the house and changing where everything is, and then expecting you to go back into your house and not be upset. Because at this point, the data that we put in online is almost the same as the data that we have in real life. 
Uh, and people are definitely hoarding now like they would in, in real life. You know, you see a hoarder's home with like newspapers and cats, and now we have our phones filled with news articles and pictures of cats, and it just doesn't take up that much space, right? Um, so how can we design for, for privacy? The, the temporary solution is simply privacy by design, privacy being entered into all of the states of when you design an application, uh, be it terms of service, telling the community that you're going to change the terms of service like two months before and having them review those changes to make sure that they're okay with it and vote on it, to just involving people in every aspect of the process and having um, you know, your terms of service and your privacy agreement can be legalese down here, but very simple, uh, you know, very simple, small, one sentence descriptions of, of each thing for, for each paragraph so that people can read it. And Creative Commons does a great job of this. If you look at how they've designed their logos and, and how they designed their, their system, it's very easy to understand. And then the longer term solution is you own your own data and then maybe you send it out to other social networks or you be careful about what you post online, unfortunately. Uh, so contextual privacy works out pretty well where when you share a piece of content, you are given the privacy options then uh, versus futzing with 50 pages of privacy options to set everything up. Contextual works a lot better because it's in the moment that you're sharing, you know what you're sharing and who you want to share it to. And then half of privacy is perceived. Right? So it's this kind of social creation of people feeling like they're okay with sharing a certain piece of data. But the behavior can change when a norm changes. So people's norms change all the time with technology. Um, so let's talk about feature phones. Feature phones came out, eventually most people had a feature phone, like a, a dumb phone without a bunch of extra stuff. And once that happened, there was this new phone that came out, which is uh, uh, the uh, smartphone. right? So the feature phone had text and voice calls. It didn't have that many apps. So it was hard to download an app. And everybody ended up having them. But then the smartphone came out with a smartphone camera. And if you look 10, 12 years ago, there's all these articles about, oh, no, everybody's going to be taking a picture of everybody all the time. And if I walk down the street, everyone's going to take a picture of me. It turns out that people's lives are pretty boring. And um, even though everybody has a smartphone in their pocket, they don't often take tons and tons of pictures unless it's an important event. Uh, so after a while, people were okay with smartphones, cameras, and it just kind of blended into the fabric of reality. And now the norm is that everybody has a smartphone camera, so it's not a big deal anymore. Uh, but let's look at Google Glass instead. Google Glass entered the market with how many, like 10 or 20 different features. People had no idea what it really did. And so they made all these assumptions that it's recording everybody all the time. It's always taking pictures. It was right here in front of your eye. You know, it was, it was in the way. And so you didn't have any of the run up of everybody has glass in their car to get turn by turn directions, right? If it just did that and then two years later, they're like, and now you can get text messages and now you can wear it outside of a car. You know, slowly over the course of 10 years, this could have been entered into the market but because it wasn't slowly entered in bit by bit by bit, people were afraid of it. First off, it wasn't evenly distributed and it was too expensive. And you think back to like the first elevators that were installed in high rise buildings. It wasn't that the technology wasn't there to allow people to go up and down in an elevator really fast. People weren't used to it yet. So they complained, they said, ow, my eardrums hurt. And the elevators had to be artificially slowed down. So it's not that the technology isn't here, it's just it has to be introduced to people in a certain way so that they feel comfortable with it. And that's kind of the idea behind a calm technology. It's, it needs to enter into your life. People's lives need to be studied in a way that you can actually have this be a friendly part of people's life so that they, so that they accept it and, and make it part of their family, so to speak, like the Roomba. So what was different between the iPhone launch and the Google Glass launch. Like iPhone, here's a screen, now you can do anything with it. Um, there was all the secrecy and mystery and exclusivity and the price and there's just everything going wrong for it in the very beginning. Um, and people weren't playing with it. People were confused. There was all this speculation and then that led to fear. Whereas with the iPhone launch, people had developer tools before the iPhone came out. People could figure it out. Anybody could pay me $99 and build an app. By the time that the iPhone came out, people had built all sorts of weird stuff. And that weird stuff led to more and more people building serious things. That play in the beginning allowed people to get into building applications. So I wore this around a lot, and people just asked me the same questions. Are you recording me right now? 
And it, that was just number one. I was like, oh, well, it's done. It's over, you know. And, uh, and in a way, it was sad, but, you know, it happens, right? We have to wait for a longer period of time for something to enter into the market peacefully <laughs> instead of jarringly. Uh, so in conclusion, if you talk about really good design, um, really good design is allowing people to take out all of those different little steps to get to their goals so that you're just compressing time and space that it takes to get somebody to do something. And that's great, right? And then if you add Calm Technology on top of that, it allows people to accomplish the same goals, compressing all those steps with the least amount of mental cost. So we design these things with mental cost and attention cost in mind and also bandwidth and, and supply chain. Then we get to this technology that allows people to accomplish their goals a little bit better that we don't have to go crazy about supporting and, and worrying about updating all the time. If we look at, and I, I know this is an awkward thing to say, but if we look at desktop technology, like early versions of Photoshop, development team worked on that product, released it, and it was pretty stable for two years, and then they'd release it again. You know, you didn't have a, a continuous thing where, oh no, it, you know, here's our cloud software, and it's broken, and then it's broken again, and um, like trying to update a, an iPhone, for instance, I try not to until three or four months after the new software is out because things will invariably break and I get really upset about having to press a button five times to get to something that would have taken me one click before in the earlier version of the operating system. So there's all that complexity that happens that, that gets really in the way of just getting to what you need to do. So um, again, a person's primary task should be not computing but being human. When you go home, you shouldn't have to system administer your house. And so the best technology is invisible and just gets out of the way, lets you live your life, blends in the background, and becomes really boring, <laughs> actually, so that you don't really think about it again. Like People don't talk about There's no conferences on washers and dryers. It's just everybody has one, and they use it. That's a really advanced piece of technology. Um, so I made this site called calmtechnology.com. You can find more stuff here. And I hope this was useful for you guys. So thank you very much. Have you answered them? Um, what do you actually really do at, at Esri? What do you, <laughs> what do, what do, you do? What do you do every what day? What do I do? Yeah. Oh. Um. <laughs> Did that sound right? Sure. Um, that's, question, yeah, yeah. that's a good question. So uh, I'll go back a little bit. In college, I was obsessed with like space and time and mobile phones. So I wrote my thesis on mobile phones and I was trying to figure out the next generation of the interface where you have like solid buttons and then you have a screen where there's liquid buttons and then I was like well, the next generation of the button is the air where you can walk into a button and it has something happen in the real world. So I wrote my thesis on that. Then I found that people weren't really building a version of that in the real world. So I did this little startup called Geoloki and then two years later Esri bought our startup and we merged all of the technology into Esri, and then I made this R&D center in Portland, Oregon, and hired a bunch of people. So we work on two things at Esri. First, we work on making Esri technology easier to use, and then second, we have this thing called the GeoTrigger service, which allows you to set up actions based on locations. Um, and Esri is basically SimCity for the real world. Almost every city in the world uses the technology to plan uh, roads, evacuation routes, fire safety, police departments use it to figure out how to do emergency situations. Uh, Starbucks uses it to plan uh, where to put their storefronts. Uh, the core technology is called spatial analysis where you can take like 50 variables like population density, hazards, um, like long-term 50-year projections, uh, and then figure out like where to put a building or a place, the zoning, all that stuff. Um, and then you know, predict it 20, 30 years into the future. Uh, in China, they use Esri technology in, in 3D to uh, plan where to put a building. And then if the building puts a shadow on other buildings around it, uh, it calculates how much tax that building has to pay on the shadow. <laughs> so you can play the building over time with like the sun. And, and that technology is built in Switzerland. Uh, it was an acquisition called Procedural. So there's, all, there's like 200 products. It's, it's a really fascinating company. It's been around since 1969. 
uh, founded by a husband and wife team. It's still a private company, and they're still running some of the same software they built for mainframe computers. Uh, like whenever you order something from like Sears department store, that little prediction of when it's going to arrive is managed by an old piece of Esri software running since like 1985. Um, so there's, it, it's a large company that does a lot of invisible things, um, which is why it's really hard to explain what it does. But it's a fascinating place to work. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Hello. So, uh, another uh, technology that's getting smarter from like year to year is uh, cars, smart cars, and especially autonomous cars. What, what do you think about that? Mm. So what do I do th think about autonomous cars? Well, the first question I have is, how are they going to drive? Are they going to drive like your grandmother, or are they going to drive really fast? Can you set that in the car? Because if the smart car drives like an annoying relative that you hate driving with, you might not take the car. Uh, secondly, when are we going to allow, you know, if you have a kid, can you just throw your five-year-old for their first day of kindergarten into an uh, autonomous driving car and then they show up at kindergarten completely unaided? Um, the, the, I was thinking about the insides of cars, like that will change, right? So you might have, um, you know, like a, a notary service that's like <laughs> on the road all the time and then like they'll show up at your house and like sign. Or if you, you know, I, I'm thinking about like what's the first ad sponsored road trip someone's going to take across the country, right? They just start in their car, they live in their vehicle, and then they work from their vehicle, and then they, you know, they just hit all the ad sponsored location based ad spots in order to get enough money for driving. And on the way, they do like small delivery service for like Amazon, like last mile delivery service. And so they're just sitting there, and then they recreate their car, like, you know, kind of like a 1970s, like hippie crash pad with like bed and like fringe. So it's really cozy. And then they blog it, you know, and it gets on Vice magazine. Like, I'm trying to think of like what, what would happen there. But I think the importance of autonomous self-driving cars, other than reducing automobile accidents and allowing people to get drunker than ever before, <laughs> <laughs> is, um, is <laughs> that you know, people are going to have 20 to 30 percent more time to argue with other people online. As in, there's going to be many more ad impressions, right? So it's an incentive for people like Google to have autonomous self-driving cars because it increases time on the web. And so that increases the kind of information societies hold on reality. We're going to be building software more often. Like more kids are probably going to learn how to code. That, that's my like optimist in me saying that. But in reality, we'll just have more time on BuzzFeed or something like that. So there's, there's the dystopian and utopian uh, views for you. <laughs> Hopefully that's helpful. Anybody else? Did you find these concepts useful? Like, OK. Um, okay, yeah. I've got a question. Okay. Uh, you talked about this con technology uh, and you show this con technology.com. Are there any patterns or guidelines how to make our apps and services more calm? Yeah, so the, the question is about there's this website, calm technology.com. Do you have a pattern library yet? And yes, there are some examples for alert styles and some examples of calm technology on the site. And then there's a bunch of papers and some principles. And right now I'm in the middle of writing a book for O'Reilly that's going to have like 50 different examples, uh, some conceptual and some not, that I've gathered over four or five years, and then the different types of alert styles that go with them, and then a section on introducing a Calm product to the market, and then also convincing your boss that keeps wanting to put like 50 features in why this is good. Um, because that's one of the limiting things. Like we can all know as designers that the you know best way to design something is to take everything away until there's nothing left to take away. But try explaining that to your boss, right? Or your client, actually, usually more the client that wants this thing that looks like this other thing and is only going to pay you five hundred dollars for it. You know, uh, so so part of it is trying to give you an argument, like not for you personally, but for the people that you work with, so that you know we don't get into this really dystopian area where we have 50 billion devices that are constantly shouting for our attention and we're completely immobilized. At that point, like if you, this is a weird analogy, but if you play a fractal over time, a fractal gets really, really complex. And then at one point it just empties out, right? And so if you look at like fractals over time with product development, you can see like, okay, there's all these complicated things with like Blackberry and all these interfaces on mobile phones with all these buttons. And then it gets emptied out in the next revolution, which is you know, the iPhone. And then Android follows, and everything has these smooth, multi-touch screen interfaces. So I think we might see the same thing with apps, where 
the apps get really complicated and there's too many features <clears throat> and then it empties out and then there are very simple things. And you see this in the supermarket shelves. Everything is complex and then there's that one product that's like, this is the simple product. And everyone's like, I want that product because <laughs> I'm totally overwhelmed. So if we get to that turning point, we'll see the things that are really simple. And we're seeing that now with these kind of like um, very simple applications that are coming out that people are getting overwhelmed and they just want to get stuff done. And with the exception of things like Facebook, they don't have time to get really absorbed into a specific app. When you're testing it, like Calm Tech apps or Internet of Things apps, I would try like the supermarket test where you try to get somebody to not only install it, but learn your entire app when they're in the checkout line at a grocery store, when they're completely distracted, and see if they can learn it, right? Not putting them in a perfectly lit laboratory with like a nice sheet of paper and some coffee. Like, try it when they're stressed out and they hate their life, right? See if they care about your app then, because if they don't, then you've got a problem, <laughs> right? Uh, so the, <laughs> that's, that's kind of my advice for that. Uh, so what do you think, where is the tipping point where we just have to switch to this um, calm technology? Like I'm talking uh, about my experience when buying a microwave oven. I was trying to buy something which I can just turn on and it will turn off. I would hear that, okay, now it's off because it's not getting any sound, but everything looks, I have to program it. Yeah, I'm programming for, for life, so I don't want to program when I'm at home. So. And it, apparently there are no like uh, simple uh, microwave ovens anymore. Do you think we need to get uh, for this to get much more complex before we realize that we really need something simple, or are we approaching it now? So th this is a good question. It's about you know, what's the tipping point for complex technology? When can we just buy simple technology? So we're seeing this. Um, so you give the example of the microwave. We're seeing people go back to buying mid-century modern appliances, really simple ovens, really simple fridges, things that you plug in and they work that are very well designed. Now, people are paying a premium for that, right? Like, I got this vintage redesigned fan because it was really simple, right? And it's the best fan I've ever had because there's a button in the back and it turns on, it's great, right? Because it stood the test of time, right? Like, it, it, it worked, like in the 1930s during the Great Depression, right? You couldn't have something really complicated then because you have to maintain it and fix it. So people are like, we need to make simple technology because we don't have resources. So I guess there's the resource argument. Right now we have lots of resources, we have lots of funding. So we have the ability, because the tide is really high, to build the most complex stuff ever. And when the tide goes out, we might see people building simpler technology. Uh, we're already seeing like hipsters get record players and like mono technology so that you can have the experience of listening to a nice record um, versus listening to a, an already compressed stream of information over Spotify over a Bluetooth speaker. Um, so right now we're seeing half of music being produced for crappy audio interfaces <laughs> and like headsets, right? That you can't really hear a lot of like the low tones because you're on an airplane and you're listening to it through a headset. And then we're seeing a bunch of other music, people rediscovering like, you know, records <laughs> so that they can hear all these other like amazing parts of the song. And then, you know, maybe we'll have more live performances that people care about because, you know, they're kind of removed from that. So we're, we're seeing this kind of sector of, of people saying, well, I want this real thing at the height of design. And then we're seeing a bunch of other people and, and some other entire countries that say the more features are better, right? Like I have a, a washer and dryer system that has these happy beeps, you know, it's like dee dee, you know, when it's done and it's really easy to set, but I had to pay a lot for that good design. Um, so in terms of a microwave, yeah, I tried to find a microwave like that too and it just, right, you just need a dial, right? But then you have to get a really old microwave. So you go to Goodwill, right? And you say, I get this microwave. And you're like, oh no, it's like got a microwave radiation leak. Ah, All right. So it's it's kind of an issue. I think we're seeing more and more of that, and we'll see more and more of that on Kickstarter, right? We'll see somebody being like, I want to make a simple microwave, and then they'll make a Kickstarter campaign for it, and then, right? <laughs> because that's really what's going on is people saying like, I actually want this thing, and every time I try to make it at a big company, it gets shot down by a committee of thirty people. But on Kickstarter, I can have a team of two people, and we can leave our giant company and make this simple object, and then people will fund it, and then it will show up three years later than when you paid for it. But still, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, so I think there, there will, it'll be, you know, as as people say, the future is unevenly distributed. It's going to be unevenly distributed. 
And I'm concerned that if you are not middle class or upper middle class, that you'll be stuck with all these really bad technologies. You'll be stuck with hand-me-down technologies and like the crap that's really hard to use in program. And uh, Sigmund Freud wrote this book called Civilization and Discontents, which was all about, this is a quote from it is, he warns us of a future in which we are stuck with ill-fitting prosthetics, like ill-fitting <laughs> external appendages that turn against us as they get older, right? Like if you use a phone that's even two, three, or four years old now, like the interface turns against you, right? You have to like upgrade. Whereas a really well-designed piece of technology will last for 50 years or generations or like a ceramic bowl could be in a family for 200 years. We don't have these ideas anymore of generational technology, right? Because technology is new and rapidly changing because it's an extension of our mental selves instead of our physical selves. So instead of having this hammer that's the same size and shape and function for two million years, we've got this weird thing that was the size of a gymnasium that's now fits in our pockets that's larger on the inside than the outside. What the heck are we doing with that, right? So uh, we have these kind of issues where technology is in this strange kind of fizzly weird <laughs> like space where it's not stable yet. And once it stabilizes, hopefully we'll bring those concepts of design back, right? I hope. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious uh, in your opinion about the popularity of VCR in the USA. Um, in your talk you said that basically all of the interfaces has to be as simple as possible and you know not to try to, to do something smart that they are not really capable of. And there is a joke that uh, you know you have to be a genius with a PGD in setting up VCRs as mm -hmm. them not to blink 12 hours all the time. How would you explain for example popularity of the VCR in the you know middle class homes um, it's still popular, people use it, but it's, well, <clears throat> it's complicated. Yeah, so the question is about how do you explain the popularity of, of a VCR uh, and, you know, the, the joke about you have to have a PhD to learn how to set it up. So, th so this, is, this is really an issue in hardware design. So you've got hardware designers over here, right, making printers and televisions, right? And then you have all the way over here software designers, and then you have, like, print designers, right? So, like, people who are actually working on a printing press. So I did this weird thing when I hired people for our R&D center. I said, I'm gonna hire print designers and then they'll learn to develop. And they, you know, their ability to develop is a, like based on, we have to set everything up and there's all this white space and it's, it's really cool. Um, so that was, that was nice, right? But on the other hand, you have hardware designers, like the, there's this story about this anthropologist that went into, um, that went into Xerox and was studying people who were using printers. And the printer is designed by hardware technologists, so it's, hey, we want to allow everybody kind of an API into doing whatever you want, right? So that's why there's all these buttons. You can access every single bit of the hardware, right? You can turn up the brightness and contrast. You can set the amount of pages. You can do a page layout. You can do a zoom level. You can make the paper larger or smaller. Like, everything's out there, right? And so for a hardware designer, that's amazing. It's so accessible, right? Wow, you can do anything you want, right? Because they're used to that level of complexity. So this anthropologist came in and said, you know, everybody just needs a big green button that says copy. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the number one thing that they're doing with this. And, that, and that's the legend of where the big green button on a copy machine came from. Uh, so you have these people building televisions, and that's where you get the AV1, AV2, AV3 inputs, and where you get all the complexity on the, on the back of the machines. And then you've got a VCR designed by a completely different company, you know, Magnavox, trying to work with a Philips television, and then you've got to also set up your Nintendo 64 and your PlayStation and your Dreamcast or whatever other vintage technology you want to hang out with your kid and play. And then you've got to set up your Apple TV. You know, and, and so all this stuff, speaking different languages, is crossing. And really the television is where you get like the first convergence of Internet of Things speaking different languages and leading to a dystopian scenario. And then you've got a remote control for every single one. And because it's hardware first design, you don't get like the smooth interfaces that you might over in software. So like you look at the Philips Hue bulb and that's definitely hardware first design where it might be really beautifully designed physical object, but how to use it in their app isn't very well done. And what they could have done better is just made a really nice, easy to use API and, you know, and they have this simple app, but now everybody's made these much better Hue apps. So when you get a Hue light bulb, you don't use the regular Hue app, you use somebody else's third party app, right? 
so that's the hardest. Like you rarely see a team in which the two completely different ways of thinking about something converge, right? You, it's really hard to find. Like smart things is probably one of the ones that I've encountered. It's a home automation technology that allows you to like track opening and door, uh, closing doors and lights and stuff. But they have really good technology and they have really good software too. But it's just because they're different. They're completely different methods, right? The way you design hardware is we have to put all these things in. We're writing assembly code. We're writing in, you know, really low level, you know, on the core processor, right? And then you have to release it and send it to a factory, and then it comes back, right? So it's it's very different. <laughs> and then you know, 10% of your components are going to fail on the factory assembly line, and you have to be okay with that. And then you've got software. It's like, well, we can change it, and we can design it this way, and we can make it flexible. And then you see that with 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 cars, all the different devices and cars like we were trying to embed our software into like a Mercedes or something like that so you could share your location with somebody and then they would see you as you arrived on their phone and they're like okay well that'll take 10 years <laughs> right so it's just the changing nature of things and you know people like a VCR people like these other things because you know, they want to play media right but getting the things to talk to each other's really hard so I think we're out of time. I see the zero zero. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very much.